Moving faster every day Some may say we've lost our way But waiting patiently In everything is truth How can we be the change? How can we start this change? Let's take a step back from the brink into each other's eyes Reach out for that central link And organize Reaching the rays of hope Guiding the ways to go The central link The central link the Central Link. Hi, welcome to the second episode of The Central Link. I'm Andrew Fake. You know, there's a lot of good things happening in our community. Make sure that you check out our community calendar on our website, thecentrallink.tv. Two of those upcoming events are York's Go Green in the City on April 21st and Energy Stock, slated for June 9th. I'm here with some of the key planners of those events, John Clark, Steve Izzo, and Melissa Grove. John, I'm going to start with you since this episode is primarily about alternative energy. Uh, could you tell folks what they can expect if they go to Energy Stock? Sure. Uh, energy Stock is sponsored by the Green Party of York. Uh, it's going to be held down at the Cadoris Creek Boat Basin on Philadelphia Street uh, from 11 a.m. until dusk. And we're going to have live music all day, um, food vendors, and also renewable energy vendors, and people can come out and learn more about renewable energy here in York. That is great. I know that for so many of us, myself included, it is a learning experience. We recently got a lesson from uh, Stewartstown Electrical Service about the science behind solar panels, how they work, and what are some of the economic incentives for why someone might want to invest in them. The energy in sunlight falling on the U.S. daily is more than enough. At the common rate of two cents per kilowatt hour, the sun sends the Earth one billion dollars worth of energy every second, and it's coming to us free. My name is Matt Jones, this is Rich Hoover, and this is Will Long to my left, and we're Stewartstown Electrical Service, LLC. And we've been asked today to talk with you a little bit about solar, and to explain a little bit of the functionality behind solar, and why it's become a fairly popular installation over the past three years here in the Pennsylvania area. Here with us today we've got two panels. We have a mono panel and we have a poly solar panel and both of these are perfectly legitimate options for installing for a solar system. The mono is slightly more efficient and grows from pure silicone cells. Its Sunday go to meeting name is silicon dioxide. Separate out the oxygen and the bits of seaweed, bottle tops and other odds and ends and we have left a metal silicon. Now melt the silicon and add just a pinch of arsenic for flavor. Slice off a razor thin wafer. Put the wafer into the oven. Fill oven with a boron gas. Connect one wire from electric motor to boron icing and the other wire to the wafer itself. Expose wafer to sunlight. Presto! Pure silicone cells that are then cut much like a tree versus the poly which is Similar to a plywood, um, as an analogy would go, it's a bunch of uh, flakes of silicone that are pressed together to form each individual cell. So slightly less efficient, slightly more efficient. Of course, cost-wise, that also comes into play. Monos are typically more expensive, and polys are typically slightly less expensive. So those are the two options that are predominantly out on the market for solar systems. Each panel, regardless of the style, is made up of a cell and there are rows and columns to those cells and within each individual cell there's a slight conductor about a hairline conductor that then flows those electrons into slightly larger trunks that flows upward into slightly larger conductors until we get to the back of the panel which then has the wires 
that connect to the panel next to it and so on down the road. The way that panels actually work, the sun produces photons and those photons are little bits of energy and they help us to see. That's what our eyes pick up as well in order to have the energy to notice colors and to notice shapes. In the solar panels case, it is looking for is two layers inside of each, each little cell. And those two layers are one's positively charged and one's negatively charged. The photons are then enter into the cell and bounce around and in so doing knock off electrons that are necessary to produce that electricity. Those electrons are going to want to flow to the path of least resistance. So that's where we get into our conductors and where they flow from. And of course their flowing is direct current or DC energy. And direct current is a great start but in order to work in our homes we have to convert that to alternating current. The motion of the electrons is a representation of an alternating current. And the way we do that is through an inverter. And here with us today, Will and I have three different inverters, actually, two of which come from the same class. And the third one at the end um, comes from a, a different um, mindset or a different installation technique. Uh, the first two here are called string inverters. And these come from the mindset of let's run all the panels or uh, the majority of the multiple panels into one inverter and convert all that power from those panels through one inverter. Um, and here we have two different sizes so that we can customize the installation for the amount of panels that we're installing. Uh, the, third, or the third inverter down here is called a microinverter. And that comes from the technology mindset of let's have one inverter for every panel. That way you have an individual setup and each panel produces its own DC power that's converted immediately or inverted immediately into alternating current right at the rooftop and then sent on down. Advantages and disadvantages. Um, advantages are that we have less parts with a central or string inverter system. Whereas with a microinverter we have more points of fail failure. Advantages are that the microinverter system has an individual system for each panel. So what's going on with its neighbor uh, is not uh, impacted uh, down the road, down the string. So each inverter panel combination works as its own solar system. Whereas with the string inverter system, we have a weakest link syndrome that can occur, or a Christmas light syndrome that can occur, as some people might understand, um, in that if one panel fails, it definitely hurts the rest of the string. Uh, however, economically, price-wise, the string inverter systems are less expensive, and microinverter systems are more expensive. Once the solar system is completed, the utility company will install what's known as a bidirectional meter or a net meter. Wires lead to a meter which records the amount of electrical energy used. And that meter measures electricity that is coming in that you're using off the grid, and it also measures electricity that you send out to the grid. So at the end of the month, you get a bill that shows the subtraction of the two. It shows what you currently drew in for the month and it also subtracts off what you sent back out. And that's to a large degree where your electricity savings occurs. It's designed to pay you back over a period of time in that you buy the upfront equipment, you've invested in that, and from that point on, the fuel is entirely free. It comes from our sun. Enter Mr. Sun. This particular system that we have pictured here is an average solar system. And in this case, it was done on the pole building, on a detached garage of the dwelling. This particular system does offset 100% of the bill, anywhere between 95 and sometimes a little bit over 100%, depending on the month. In fact, they produce nearly double what they do during the summer months than what they do in the winter months. But on average, solar systems are designed to offset an entire electric bill. Uh, solar systems have a 30% federal tax credit. Our federal government has said that this is something that they want to invest in, that they feel it's important for our future. So that's a tax credit. Now, that's not a deduction, but a credit. And the credit actually helps you dollar for dollar based on your tax liability at the end of the year. Of course, that's your upfront incentive. That gets your system down. Now the rest of your system has to be paid off from two ways. The first way is of course reducing your electricity costs. And in, like I said, with an average size system, we typically offset close to 100% of that. So with that being said, that's usually for most folks somewhere between $1,800 and $2,000 a year in electricity savings. The second way 
is through what's known as an SREC market, and that stands for Solar Renewable Energy Credit. One credit equals 1,000 kilowatt hours. An average system usually generates between 8 and 10, sometimes 12 of those credits per year. With that being said, the average return on investment for a solar system is somewhere in the current state around 6 or 7 percent and you're counting on two things to stay active and constant for that to occur. One is the sun to shine, and the other is for electricity rates to stay at least stable, if not increase. The panels themselves do come with a 25-year warranty. Thank you a lot for taking the time out of your day to listen to us and learn a little bit about solar. I know that we've covered a good bit of material here in a short amount of time, and there is a lot to solar, and we're more than happy to share that with you at any time that we possibly can. Thank you again. Science is patiently unlocking the secrets of photosynthesis. And we may well see an era wherein solar energy, like atomic energy, may be put to work as electric power. They said it would take five to seven years to recoup the costs. Any extra energy that I produce with my solar panels, I'm able to sell back to the electric company. My name's Mary Lou Hale, and I have not had an electric bill since. Back here with event planners, John, Steve, and Melissa. Melissa, could you please tell us about Go Green in the City? Sure. Go Green in the City is being held on April 21st. It's a Saturday between Philadelphia and Market Street on North Beaver Street. We have over 28 vendors coming to join us. Lots of fun. The shops on North Beaver Street are open. Central Market is open. We have live music, and you can find out real easy ways to go green. Because it is important for us to try to become green, not only as individual consumers, but also as businesses. We visited Morningstar Marketplace out in Thomasville off of Route 30, and they have a huge solar farm. Let's check it out. Hello, this is Andy and Deb Lentz. We're with, we're with Morningstar Solar which is part of Morningstar Market, just west of York. We have 631 kW solar farm here, which powers our market, our facility, and business, plus about an additional 50 to 60 homes. One of these systems puts out 240 volts DC. So you put all these together, they call it a, a, an array, okay, DC voltage. It comes back into here. Now this is a, uh, this is a, called an inverter, okay? It's made by Schneider Electric, uh, which is a good company. And what it does is it converts the, the DC into AC voltage. And this is a 500 kW. The one up there is a 100 kW to meet the 600 that we have. The power then turns into AC voltage goes to the switch gear, which sort of like controls electricity a little bit. And then to get it in a perfect form for the, for the grid, it goes into the transformer out there, I think it's fed onto the grid. This, this is a special meter right here. What that thing does, it actually meet, reads the voltage both ways, coming and going. So it reads what we use here, which is very little, and also it reads what's going back onto the grid. It's a special meter. Something else we're doing this year is our property within, within the solar farm is fenced in. We're going to be doing an Adopt the Sheep program this year, which lets the local kids have their own sheep at our facility. At the end of the year, we'll cut the wool, they'll get the money, and the sheep will actually take care of our property and maintain our grass within the solar farm. And it'll keep the solar panels cleaner. It's also a friendly green thing to do. It's always facing south. That was Morningstar Solar, courtesy of the Lenses. There's a lot to see and do at Morningstar Market, and we'll cover that in future episodes. Steve, besides solar, what are some other sources of renewable energy that someone can get? Uh, there's wind generation, there's hydro, there's geothermal, and then there's the smart grid, which is a system of connectivity between sources and receivers. It's much more sophisticated than what we have now. In New Park, PA, there's a fellow by the name of Jay McGinnis who's tried it all. Here's his story. What I, what, what I want to do is become totally energy self-sufficient. I make 
twice the amount of electricity I use because this is a farm and my fan business, which I use electric in both, I, I write it off as a machinery cost for that. So that's been a lot of help. It's able to equalize the amount of gas and follow the sun uh, during the day. It takes a while to get them waking up, so to speak, or get them to turn into the morning sun. With electric drive, that, that isn't an issue. Those, those are both really rare machines. They're power mills, which uh, were built over a hundred years ago. They're both air motors, which is the only windmill company left, by the way. There used to be over a hundred companies that built windmills. N none of them around anymore. They're gone. I, was, I, I consider it a mistake that I bought that. It only provides maybe 10% of the electricity I could use here. We have a lot more sun than we do wind. Now, if you're off the grid and you're charging batteries, I would want one <laughs> because in the winter we have 10 to 12 mile an hour wind and not as much sun. And there is a solar hot water heater. Those are the vacuum tubes. They're connected in the basement to a tank through, through heat exchangers and puts the heat into the tank in the basement. Air conditioning is almost free. I mean, it costs very little to run a geothermal air conditioning because you already you have 55 degree water. That, that's one of the beauties of the geothermal is that you just push a button to either go to air conditioning or heating. If you want like a payback, I mean, when people say, what's your payback? And I always say, well, you know, what's the payback of a swimming pool or a fancy kitchen or, you know, it's, it's your priorities is what it amounts to. But if your payback on geothermal is probably the greatest of all these things right now. Geothermal is one-third the energy use of resistance electric heat. It's like figuring out your miles per gallon of your car. And it's calculated. It's, it, you can calculate it. You know, it. It's something that can be done. Uh, my name is Dave Corba, and I'm the publisher of Natural Awakenings magazine. The magazine is a free magazine. Look for it at various distribution spots throughout your county. Uh, one of the best things about this magazine is the compelling editorial content. And my job as a local publisher is to reach out here to the local community. So I know there's a lot happening here in York, and I'm very excited that the magazine is here uh, to help educate the readers and to help promote the businesses that want to reach those readers here throughout the county. Go Green in the City. Melissa. Yes. Sweet Melissa. Yes. Tell me, is there going to be some fresh local food there? There will be. Okay. Not only will Central Market be open, but some other produce vendors from Central Market will be out on the street, which is always really exciting. Um, Dave Dietz, who is an organic farmer, will be with us. Um, Sonny Wads will be with us. We have a local community garden that will be with us. So you will be able to get fresh produce all day long. Oh, Go good. Green in the city. And you know, April 21st is a great time to get some of the season's first produce and plants. We at the Central Link want to keep you up to speed as to what farmers are doing this time of year. So we visited Flinch Ball's Orchards in Hellam, where we learned how to prune peach trees. Hi, I'm Mike Flinch Ball. I'd like to welcome you here to Flinch Ball's Orchard Farm Market. We're standing out in one of our uh, peach and nectarine blocks. Uh, talking to you today a little bit about what we're doing this time of year. It's uh, March 3rd and we're out pruning peaches today. They are approximately uh, 10 to 11 years old. Um, you can see the row on the left has been pruned already. The row on the right you can see is unpruned. All this growth here was growth from last year so they grew that much over the course of a year. Basically what we do is when we're pruning we'll come in here and uh, thin them out, reduce the height. Our strategy when we prune is to try to leave long shoots uh, and the rationale behind that is uh, you get larger peaches on long straight shoots over short and uh, branched shoots. We're also trying to maintain the height of the tree at a level so that we can come in here and pick without having to use ladders. So we want the trees about eight foot tall, uh, no higher. Sometimes they're a little higher than that when we prune, but once the leaves and the fruit get on, the limbs will come down a little bit. Uh, so we can, we try to get them down to a height that we can reach 
from the ground to work in them. Uh, it's much more efficient if we can work in the orchard without having to use ladders. Peaches, uh, you can do that. Apples, it's another story. You have to let the trees get taller to get your yield, but peaches, you can keep them shorter and get a good yield off the tree. Apples, we'll start doing those first. We start, you can start those anytime the leaves come off. You can start those in December. Uh, so all of our apples are done and we're working on our peaches now. If we wouldn't have to prune, we wouldn't come in here and do it, but uh, it takes time and it costs money to do it. If we wouldn't come in and take out, thin these out, if we would get fruit in all these limbs, first of all, it'd be too many fruit. The limbs would be too heavy for the tree. It would break down. Uh, secondly, that'd be just way too many, way too many peaches on that tree. It wouldn't grow to size. Uh, and even if you try to come in and thin all those off by hand, it would, it would take you forever and be cost prohibitive. Um, another reason we prune is uh, for the tree itself. Um, especially, peaches especially, if you have real thick and they get a lot of shade, your lower branches out here tend to die out. Uh, this shoot here is dead. The reason that's dead is because it had a lot of shading on it uh, and it didn't get enough light during the summer last year to survive and it died out. So we come in here and thin them out so they can accumulate sugar and they can get a good color on them. My dad, my brother, myself and I, and then we have uh, two full-time guys and between us, we, uh, we do all the pruning over the winter. This year uh, with the warm winter we had, we're a little more advanced. I saw several that you could see the pink in the petals already starting to develop. So we are definitely concerned about it. And we'll pull the brush out into the middle of the rows here and then we'll go through with the mower and chop it all up. Uh, just basically mulch that back into the ground. Really long-term planning and thinking when you're managing all of that. Well, in five years, this block is going to be out. I better have some trees coming on into production. So. The health tip of the week or any advice on this program is for educational purposes only and is not intended as a replacement for qualified health care. Please consult your physician or health care provider before making any changes or starting new treatments. You know, it seems like spring and maybe even summer is coming very early this year. And of course, many people are thinking about, oh, how can I drop these few pounds that I picked over the winter and getting ready for the, you know, wearing shorts and even for many people wearing bathing suits. Well, you know, I don't think there's a quick fix. I think that all of these uh, supplements, uh, you know, herbal things, nutritional things, and even the pharmaceutical ones, really uh, are not going to be a long-term answer. You know, maybe some of them can be uh, a short-term, sort of a, a jump start for a system, but I think we really need to take a look at how do we restore balanced metabolism. And one thing you don't want to do is starve yourself. Dieting, really, the body doesn't understand dieting. It understands starving. So the less we eat, the more it slows down our metabolism. So we want to restore that normal metabolism by eating frequent small meals each day. I'm Willa from Sunnywald Natural Foods with the health tip of the week. Sunnywald Natural Foods. Good health comes from the farm, not the pharmacy. Sunlight coming through a window heats up everything in the room. But heat radiated back from furniture and floor is long heat waves, which the window glass stops from going back out, thus trapping the sun's heat. Dr. Maria Telkes has designed a model house in Massachusetts in which solar heat is ingeniously collected, stored, and distributed throughout the whole house. Hi, I'm Diane Delosier, and I'm the featured artist. My scenes are from the York County area, showing the beauty of the county in different seasons.
are using mulches. It conserves soil moisture. It also will regulate the temperature of the soil. It's got a very nice appeal. And another big factor is holding weeds down in your garden. Traditional bark mulch is dyed black. It seems to hold its color for at least two years. This, on the other hand, is a cocoa shell, and it is much finer. It seems to decompose better and add a little better soil structure. You take no risk of, of changing pH or anything like that in your soil. When they're wet, you can even smell the chocolate. A lot of people use mulches in their vegetables, straw and grass clippings. Now, the straw particularly usually has a few grains of wheat in it yet or even some other weeds. If you take grass clippings from a yard that was treated, you're probably gonna ruin your tomatoes for sure because they're very susceptible to that type of, of uh, chemical. A lot of vegetable gardeners now are using black plastic as a mulch in their garden. Then we have a new product, it's a biodegradable. It's actually made out of a starch-based material. The microbes in the soil will eventually eat that. We used a good bit of it here on our farm. We had trouble finding any of it in the spring here. It was completely gone. My name is Dave Miller from Miller Plant Farm and uh, thanks for joining us for your Garden Tip of the Week. We want to thank our special guests, John, Steve, and Melissa, for being here with us today. Is there anything else that you want to add? Yeah, just that Energy Stock is uh, going to have live bands, going to have good food. Uh, it's going to be outside. We're going to celebrate a clean, renewable energy future. And we still have spots open for vendors that are in the industry if they want to have a table or a booth or speak at our concert about what their business is all about. And they can contact us for more information. Melissa? Come down to the city and be green. With uh, Go Green in the City and Energy Stock, you can't, can't go wrong. Great. All right, Melissa, you've convinced us. We want to have our own booth at Go Green in the City, April 21st. So come on and check us out. That's our show. Check out our website, thecentrallink.tv, for more info and episodes. Thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm.